caused us to sort of want to talk about this is OpenRocket. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. It's a program for uh, designing and simulating uh, model rockets. Um, and in this case, case, what Upstream delivers is this thing that uh, in the Java world, you know, at least from a distributor standpoint, we call an Uber jar or a fat jar. It's a jar file, which is a Java you know, deliverable that happens to contain other jar files. And what we mean by that is that... Or other binary artifacts or whatever. Right. So <clears throat> if they use the equivalent of, you know, six other class libraries, which in the C world would be, you know, other shared libraries or, or you know, libraries of functions, uh, they're actually sort of wrapping all of those up and delivering them those, so they can give you this one sort of blob that you download. And if you're on a Windows or Mac or Linux machine, you can just run that thing and all of the dependent stuff's there. In the C world, this is the equivalent of shipping a statically linked binary where every you know, library that you depend on, every piece of code you use, every data file is all sort of statically linked into one big binary blob. And one of the downsides to that is because it's all munched together, we don't know as a distro the provenance of each piece and how it's licensed. If it is licensed, if we have rights to redistribute it, if the parts can be legally combined together and stuff like that, so it ends up making a lot of extra work. Well, it's just, it's just like if you were out on the net and you saw some you know, executable file, you, know, you wouldn't go put that in Debian main, right? It violates the free software guys. It's, it's not clearly open source. We don't you know, know where the source is. We don't have access to it. La, 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 la. So you know, one of the things that, that we think about some in the context of an application like OpenRocket is, gee, how pedantic do we want to be about this? Do we really care about all those issues? Should we just write a cute little installer thing that downloads their latest mega jar and wraps it with, you know, the thing that gets dropped in user bin that, you know, calls Java dash jar with the right path and, and does all that stuff? We could do that. That would be yeah. that would be easy from or what versions they were at or, or any of that sort of, or what licenses they have or any of that sort of stuff. So do you really want to have to do all that work of doing the forensics, of breaking this down, of refactoring their source code and their build scripts and build systems you don't necessarily understand and if you do understand you come to dislike passionately very quickly. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, do you want to sort of constantly be in the mode of, of chasing the upstream developers, trying to figure out what they just changed and why it doesn't build anymore and refactoring their code and then trying to convince them to take your changes or not? It's, it's a lot of work. The answer is, well, well, yeah, we are kind of purists, and we really do want to do it that way, but it's really hard. Well, so that, that whole process of teasing apart the dependencies can end up being a recursive process, where once you find that, oh, there is some jar that's included in, in your Uber jar, that is itself a mini Uber jar, and that has dependencies somewhere else. And what makes this expensive is, you know, we do this for Debian, others do it for Red Hat, they might do it for Gen2, and as a community, we're spending a lot of our energy repeating the same work. And the other part of the problem is that we don't tend to notice these things that happen until Upstream makes some new release, and they put out some new jar, and now all of our users are getting tickle reminders from the application, which knows how to go look at the Upstream site and sees that there's a new version and says, hey, don't you want the new version? Can I help you download this Uber jar? Um, and you're sitting there going, oh, God, you know, how, w when are we going to find the time to sit down and reverse engineer what they've changed since the last time? And, oh, wow, there's like three new things that aren't packaged in Debian yet. We've got to go figure out if that's something that we're allowed to redistribute. And if so, where's the source code? What licenses is it under? And how should we package that? <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. So we're thinking about ways that we can do a better job of collaborating with uh, upstreams. I think that, you know, you know, Monty pointed out that understanding the role of the upstream and the distros is, uh, is really important. And, you know, maybe there's some, some good lessons that we, can, that we can take away from that. Uh, one of the things that we've got in, in Debian is we have on the Debian wiki uh, the upstream guide, which is actually a really nice, very comprehensive set of tips and guidelines for upstream maintainers to make that tarball that they produce more friendly for distros to actually take and package in whatever you know packaging format that they happen to use. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, also, I don't know, is uh, Francois Marier in the room? Francois, bonjour. 
I, I, know, I know Francois, uh, it's kind of interesting. I was working on a completely separate project, and this was one that I was uh, hosting on GitHub, and all of a sudden a, a pull request came in from Francois. I didn't know Francois at the time, but now I, I know that he's working at, uh, for Mozilla on some really cool project, and I realized he was here. And because of that, and I saw his name on the Debian Wiki page, he's got a lot of great blogs about how to, as an upstream, uh, do a better job as an upstream, so I just wanted to call that out. Um, also, I, I have a link, and I'll try to publish my, my slides on my, on my wiki uh, later so you can actually get some of these links. But there's, there's uh, Spot Callaway from uh, Red Hat has uh, published a nice guide also, and I'm sure a lot of different distributions have guides on how to be a good upstream. And I think that, you know, thinking about how we can do that socially and technically um, is really important. And speaking about the technical part of that, I wanted to highlight for you, if you're not aware of it, um, some interesting research that's been going on, particularly at the University of Paris and at INRIA in France, on uh, some work to share metadata information. Um, if you think of a distribution as a repository that has a set of packages, where each package has a name and a version, and what users want to do is they either want to install, install a set of packages or upgrade them or remove them. And they might have some preferences about do they want to be bleeding edge or do they want to be super stable. This is collectively what is known as the upgrade problem. And this research group called Nankusi, or Managing the Complexity of Open Source Software, actually has done a really great job of looking at this upgrade problem and breaking apart the dependency solving part of it from the UI. The reason that this is interesting is we just rattled off all these different <coughs> language environments, um, in fact all the different distro package managers that resolve the dependency problem. And the research that, uh, that I'll give you pointers to highlights the fact that if you can make that a pluggable API between the solving of the dependencies, which is very complex, and the UI for the particular environment, you can actually test and debug and evolve the uh, dependency solvers and end up with much higher quality ones that do a better job of meeting the constraints that you've requested and also do it in as much as one one hundredth of the time. Um, so uh, this is called, uh, the format for this API is called the Common Upgrade Description Format or a CDF and um, it's a very simple text-based format. It's actually sort of a subset of uh, what you'd see in Debian control files. Uh, I want to do is mention that this is already in use, for example, in the Eclipse IDE for their plugin manager to resolve dependencies. Um, we talked about language dependency solvers. OCaml's uh, package manager, OPAM, uses this, this infrastructure. Um, Debian has a package called uh, apt-cdf, which allows you to use pluggable solvers within uh, APT. Um, so the point is that Maybe we can use an API like CUDF as a way to express metadata perhaps between each of our distributions and maybe even uh, between upstreams and distributions. And, and um, you know, the, the question is maybe can we formulate in this machine readable way, you know, what it is that as distros we care about from uh, upstreams and can we ask upstreams to include metadata in their tarballs so that they can uh, help all the distros solve this problem uh, together instead of duplicating the effort every time. Yeah, and to be absolutely clear, you know, I mentioned OpenRocket. It's not that the upstream developers are bad people. In fact, quite the contrary. They are awesome folks. I love interacting with them. They have a very active mailing list. There's an IRC channel. There's usually somebody there every time we're stumbling with something. And I have this strong suspicion that if we were very clear and concise about what it is that we needed them to do as they were grabbing new code and dropping it into their source repositories to capture sort of the minimum required set of metadata so that this reverse engineering of what they had done that we now needed to figure out and you know refactor to package things appropriately in our distro, if we were good at articulating that, I suspect they'd be happy to do it. Um, but we really sort of haven't asked them this question yet because we keep sort of struggling back and forth about exactly what's the right way to do this and can we figure out how to do this in a way that doesn't just help our immediate problem but 
you know, maybe is more useful across distribution boundaries. So I'm curious, um, of the folks that are in the room, how many of you um, actively package things for one or another Linux distribution? That's a fair number of people. Which distributions? Just yell them out. What do you, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> okay, so yeah, it is the universal operating system. It's the solution to all your problems. Anything other than Debian? Fedora. Gen 2, Fedora, PPAs, yeah. Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat, <laughs> Yeah, you're sick, man. <laughs> okay, so you know the answer and you can just tell it to us all because you do it for everybody, right? <laughs> it's, it's pain. It's pain, yeah. yeah. I mean, some guys do it really well. I mean, occasionally you've got a tarball down, so it's gone. Um, there's some guys that have done really good jobs that put all the Debian config files in a way that work intelligently for Ubuntu. We've got spec files, multiple distributions. You know, I've worked inside a corporation where if we were do, touching anything from a third party that wasn't coming officially from a distro, we had to rebuild, repackage, uh, validate, GPG sign, and so on before we could provide it to any of our downstream customers that we were supporting and deal with all the dependency issues um, and then track. Um, in some cases, all those security alerts around all the various subcomponents that we were again having to make available to our customers. Well, I think Monty made a really interesting point in his talk about, you know, is it time to rethink sort of what the role of a distribution is and maybe have a distribution focus on a very much smaller problem? I find that every time I'm forced to deal with some Linux distribution other than Debian, the immediate strongly negative reaction that I have is, oh my God, they're forcing me to have to go to more than one place to find the things I need to do to solve my, my, my challenge. And, you know, I guess I'm just spoiled, but when you live in Debian space, if you need, you know, GPG, you just apt get install it. And, you know, if the package exists at all, it's assumed to comply with the policies, you know, the current policy documents and all that sort of thing. And anything you find that's wrong, you know where to go to file a bug about it, and that somebody will eventually get around to look at it. Yeah, you know, you, you just sort of assume that if you <coughs> report a bug, eventually somebody will look at it, and unless, of course, it's BDO who maintains it. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, you know, that th there's just sort of this, this wonderful sort of set of expectations when you have a distro that has, what is it now, 27,000 and some packages. The chances are very high at any given moment that something you think of that you'd like to work on, somebody else has already packaged the bits, and you don't really have to... You know, do a lot of work, except that, you know, those of us who actually are the ones who make all of that work do actually have to do all that work. So, um, I don't know, any of you have thoughts, uh, other thoughts about, yeah? I was actually going to take the opposite position. As a Debian packager and as an upstream for other things, my preference is to keep the packaging completely separate. So, an editor that I work with, I, I've had lots of discussions with Tom who's upstream, and it's like, well, no, actually, don't put my packaging in your repository because we're always one revi revision out of sync. Any changes I make go back to him to be patched into the next revision. And I've still got a diff because I've, I've, if nothing else, I've got the changelog entry. Um, but it's typically more than that as well. And so. Yeah, I've certainly played on both sides of that debate as well. Um, I, I actually went through all of the complex gymnastics to do copyright assignment to the FSF as an employee of HP when I still was so that the contents of the Debian directory for GNU Radio could get merged upstream so that they could do builds for various Ubuntu versions, things I didn't care about. Actually okay. <clears throat> yes, I, the consequence of that is I became a GNU Radio upstream committer and all I've ever touched is the contents of the Debian directory. But uh, <clears throat> the problem is even then, I wasn't actually using the upstream repo as the place that was my canonical sort of source of, of bits for doing my builds. And so there was always that sort of you know, dichotomy thing going on. On one hand, it was really cool that Upstream cared about at least one distribution that used the same packaging format that I did, so they were mostly inclined to keep those builds working. But actually, it's another thing that um, Tom and I have had some very hold, recent... Hold, hold that thought for okay, just, okay, okay. just a second, because uh, you didn't really come back to the thing that, <laughs> that Monty had sort of suggested, that maybe, maybe distros need to lose some weight and be just provide C compilers. And here's the problem or the fear that I have is that when upstreams have sufficiently complex products that need 
you know, maybe they need some authentication layer, maybe they need some database layer, maybe they have some application server, maybe they have blah, blah, blah. And oh, the most easy way to handle that or to, to distribute that is as a virtual image. I will give you a virtual box image, I will give you an OpenStack image, I'll give you something else. And if that's all you ever wanted to do, that's, that's awesome. But I find a lot of times, you know, and I'm sure that you do too, that you want to take upstream A and you want to combine it with upstream B, and you want to make your own glue, and maybe some other upstream D, and they all have to live within the same space. You don't actually want to, you know, do, you know, TCP IP to communicate between all these different environments. That's why I think having the rich distro is still really, really useful. What do you think? Well, yeah, and I've, we've certainly seen cases where um, upstreams or, you know, projects, OpenStack's a great example, where there's a lot of complexity. It, it could certainly be reasonable to think in terms of creating an installer image that has some kind of lightly derived version of a particular distro so that you have, you know, one deliverable product. And, and maybe it's important to you to be able to test everything in sort of a working live environment like that or something. I don't know. But on the flip side, um, I find that every time I end up in a situation where I've got more than one sources of the stuff that I depend on that I'm having to install things from and I have more than one path through which I might have to report on um, bugs or defects or enhancement requests or whatever, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, allowing complexity back in my life that I've managed to elide by, you know, choosing to live in the world of something like a Debian distribution. So, I, I, you know, I, I, on some philosophical intellectual level, I, I can sort of hear this argument and go, yeah, I can see why it might be really nice in some context for us to somehow you know, pull back in and, and not try to encompass the entire world, and then the, my hind brain immediately kicks in and goes, "You fool! Don't don't ever let yourself be dragged back down into that space." Yeah. One way I think that we could uh, address this is to get upstream to both have and developers that are interested in maintaining old versions, which are currently in stable distros. Um, any words to uh, help encourage that? I think that's actually a great lead into the continuous integration stuff we've been playing with. Well, you know, part of part of the thought, and this is really, you know, we were just thinking, brainstorming about ways that we could have distros and, and upstreams collaborate better, and it, it seems like there's got to be an opportunity around <laughs> continuous integration um, to check, I mean, a lot of, you know, what Monty was saying, you know, in, in that case where you would do a commit and actually try to build packages from it, um, I would think it has some advantages to flesh out dependency <coughs> complex dependency graph issues early. Is it, yeah, it's really expensive, but machine time is cheap. So after Tom showed up at this rocket launch last year and kind of got enthusiastic, he and his boys all got enthusiastic about you know, playing rocketry games with us, and we started trying to rope Tom into helping us deal with software, we of course went, oh, you know, Tom, he's got like Java next to his name somehow. He must want to help us work on the Android app for our new cool toys, right? <laughs> Haven't managed to suck him into that yet, but what he sort of volunteered to do that I think Keith and I initially went, yeah, okay, fine, whatever, it doesn't seem important, but if he wants to do it, that's great, was he put up a Jenkins instance and set it up so every time we do a, a you know, push commit into our uh, you know, sort of publicly visible Git repo, it tries to build the code. And Oh my God, that's been the most wonderful thing that's ever happened because now Keith actually has a tight feedback loop every time he breaks something, Jenkins tells him. <laughs> he gets a nasty gram. It, it, used to be, <laughs> it used to be that, you know, we'd go along developing and we'd be talking over IRC and we'd be coming up with new ideas and new features and making things work and testing stuff and we'd go back and forth for a very long time and we'd go to do a release. And part of the release process is I was actually trying to build, you know, objects that we'd be willing to hand to, you know, paying customers. And I'd stumble over all the stuff that he just sort of installed in his build environment over time as he was making things work. And I had to reverse engineer all these build dependencies and stuff. And I have to admit that the fact that now, you know, we have this sort of uh, independent sitting over on the side build environment that um, uh, Tom's running <coughs> uh, causes us to very quickly know when, oops, uh, you know, that doesn't build anymore. And Oh, it's because now we need to have such and such, you know, new thing installed in the build environment. Another Java library. Yeah, another Java library. <laughs> and so, you know, there's still, 
you know, the, the one challenge is that the way it gets fixed right now is Tom goes and installs that particular No, thing. no, no. The way that this happens is Jenkins sends Keith a nasty gram. Yes. <laughs> Keith gets on IRC and he says, Tom, would you please install package foo? And then I go in and install package foo, and then I poke Jenkins to retry, and then Jenkins says, awesome, we're happy. And then Bido goes, yeah, but you didn't actually capture that in the Debian control file, so I'm still... <laughs> So please, can we get Jenkins using something like git build package instead of doing this with just the source checkout? And anyway, we'll we'll get there. But That's the next step. Uh, it's 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 really been very interesting to see if we sort of think of Keith as being the primary upstream author of the software for the rocketry stuff, which is absolutely literally true. And you know, Tom and I are acting as sort of the people trying to you know be the distributors and package it and all. Uh, we have discovered that, that having this sort of mutual uh, sort of interface through a Jenkins instance is really helpful. And I think, you know, in, 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 in your world, Manu, the notion of regardless of whether it's PPA or stuff or, you know, auto building things that you're doing in your infrastructure, there certainly seems to me to be some kind of middle ground between, you know, this is only an upstream thing, this is only a distro thing, where the point of collaboration could become, <coughs> you know, how do we most successfully capture the information, the metadata that's required to make auto builders capable of continuously building things as we go along? And just figuring out the right way to do that so it's not tied to a particular distro at a particular release level so much, but is you know, capturing better metadata is probably a good way to do it. In the thing called which has been around for a while, is some tooling that's been built up over time, and that is a description of the project. It's a language for describing projects I haven't run into that at all. Huh, dope. It, it like DOAP or? DOAP. Okay, cool. See. Um, coming back to the, this idea of this metadata that we have, this description that we use upstream and the distribution, really has got to be shared bi-directionally. Um, you know, we need that the common well-defined distribution releases, for example, particularly with the uh, arrival of things like LTS releases and enterprise distributions, where we want some long-term stability, that there's a well-defined list of what those components are for upstream to develop against, yeah, it's a, to validate it's, against. Because there's nothing worse than, all of a sudden, there's a new LTS has been out for nine months of a given release, and the new food doesn't work on it anymore. Because right. we've already moved that much further. Yeah? Right. So, just a second. The, the, uh, it makes me think that what we could do is uh, robotically extract the repository metadata from the distro and publish that in a raw format. Actually, uh, I know that as part of the EDOSH project, there's this site called Debian Weather that basically does this and checks to see if all the packages are installable at any given time and if and if they're not then you get you know then the weather turns rainy and if it's really broken then it's thunderstorms and black and it's all bad yeah you know other folks have done things like try to automatically rebuild all the source packages in the archive and things like that and uh, you know it's a good excuse to warm up your cluster once in a while so you had a one problem I've had with the SAMPA project, we've just released SAMPA 4, and at the moment there aren't even packages for SAMPA 4.0 of everything. So I'm going to talk about it, it's just everything. We end up trying to tell our users what things they have to install, and the OS requirements page has become this for Debian, this for Ubuntu, or most of this same, this for Fedora, this for <coughs> Dell, this for, and the list is just being endlessly long. And of course, if I change something, I've got to go and try and sort of put the right things in there, remove the things that, because it's a wiki page that users have put up here, yeah, of course. they might have needed, or thought they needed, just gets put in the line. And it's a real problem for us, because trying to even maintain that for about 10 different operating systems, it's insane, but otherwise our users fail on the basic requirements and can't build their DC. So it's a real issue for us as an upstream as well as so this is why I go back to this notion I commented on a few minutes ago that I have a strong suspicion that most upstreams 
would happily do the little bit of extra overhead required to be helpful if we were just good in a cross distro. You know, if I go to them and say, you know, I'm a Debian guy and in order to do this right in Debian, you need to do the following things for me. Their answer is going to be, oh God, now I'm going to have 12 other distros telling me what they need to. I suspect we went to them and said, hey, look, there's this well understood boundary condition problem between, you know, what you as an upstream want to work on and what distributors and packagers of your software would, would like to work on. Um, you know, here's our cookbook for you. Here's our, our, our recipe guide for you. Do these things in this kind of way. Have this kind of a file somewhere in your source distribution that captures these little bits of metadata for us. I bet you most upstreams would actually be willing to do that. My experience is a lot of the, the craziness that we have to deal with is distribution package maintainers where we talk about, you know, insane upstreams and stuff like that is that they just haven't ever thought about the issues. They haven't stumbled over it. Nobody's tried to ask them why they didn't do something a certain way. It's certainly been the case that every time I've run into some crazy ass license, just asking the upstream, would you consider picking one of the ones that's on the OSI approved list that is also you know, considered DFSG compliant, almost always the answer is, oh yeah, never, th never occurred to me that anybody would actually care about my code enough for this to matter. And <clears throat> you know, in general, you know, I think it's true that you know, people want to do the right things, that they have some idea what the right thing to do is, they're willing to do it. So I'm sure there will always be an upstream somewhere that, you know, wants to just lob rotten fruit at us, but, yeah. I, if, you, if you work out a common descriptor for that, and then, you, and then you expect the upstreams to maintain it when they're not using it for their own builds, I think that's problematic. I don't know that I would expect them to maintain all of it, but uh, if, if, they under, if, they understood, if they understood the value of that metadata... Right. And I'm and thinking along the lines of if we had a new build tool that was attractive because it made your life easier, that would mean that... That's, an, yeah, that's an NP-complete problem, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. The other thing is there are packaging formats already that have got this metadata in that we could extract. So we could take what's in a, um, a whole module's specification of its dependencies and map that to our dependencies. Well, we have, I mean, we have the, the, the part right now, we have, and actually I just sent some messages to some people based on the thing you had up there a second ago. Um, but like OpenStack, we can, we can list our Python dependencies, but I can't tell you that you've also got to install MySQL and libvirt. Because right. those are Debian packages or Fedora packages or right. whatever, and how do I put, how do I express that in my Python project? I don't know. I'm well, it's, it's, it gets a readme little... file right now, and that doesn't. You know. We all understand there's another element of complexity in that you know not only do distributions not always pick the same name for packages, but one of the things that differentiates different Linux distributions is the granularity at which they package things. And in Debian, that was a very conscious set of decisions a long time ago that going with a finer granularity actually sort of makes lots of things work better. But it does sometimes make it harder if you're trying to manage this kind of information because, you know, uh, it does mean that sometimes the names get more complicated because it's not just, you know, blah. It's, you know, you need blah three something or other, whatever. So we've got about three minutes left. There's a question back here and then there's Joey. I was going to say, in, in practice, this question becomes also not as bad as it might be in theory, in that upstreams for a long time have just had a readme file that says, you know, you'll also need these other things, at least this version. And sure, that's not machine readable, but, you know, it's there, and it's actually not that big a deal to translate that into your local when you're a maintainer. And also, this work doesn't get redone for all the different distros because the maintainer if they're aware of it, if you're thinking about it, we'll go look at how does Redhead guys package it, how does whatever guys package it, and you'll swap patches and you'll swap in and you'll see, oh, they have to do that patch in order to change the install rate. Or even better, the district can tell the, the Australian this is what you need to put in that section for us. I, I will admit the thing that really... Yeah, the thing that really started pushing my buttons on this was starting to deal with, you know, Java developers, Uber jars, and the fact that now all of a sudden, here's a language environment that I'm not personally terribly skilled at. I understand why it's the right thing for us to be doing our rocketry ground station software, because we have Windows and Mac users as customers, and we really can do a single source tree and build installers on Debian for all of those environments and they work. But when you have upstreams who have never even thought about the fact that there might be a problem with incorporating all of this stuff, they actually think it's a huge benefit because now the Windows well, folks just... Now that you have done that, yeah. Red Hat Package Robot can, can gain from that. <coughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I just wish somebody at Red Hat would package open Rocket so I could borrow their. <coughs> right, right. So sorry, sorry, the sorry. Yeah, yeah. Some of this is first packager syndrome. You're absolutely right, Joey. I'm trying to pull some of this together. It seems to me that one way you could bootstrap something like this, if you had a tool that users could use that would um, say solve the problem that Samba has, that I also have of installing the dependencies so they can actually build the build your software. They have the tarball. Um, if, if there was a tool and it just said, okay. You know, I, I need these things that had to cover the distribution to get the actual package mapping, you know, the split up in Debian and so on. So there'd be a source of data in the distribution, a source of data in the tar balls of whatever projects feel like participating in this, and then a tool that users actually use. So they're actually driving the upstream projects and the distribution. So sort of like dependencies. a step before AutoConf that would go get the yeah. build depends? Yeah. So just something yeah. to get the build dependencies. Skip the building because that's a hard problem. And yeah. It's easy to say time yeah. map. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You have to have it in the distribution <coughs> and in the upstream project. What about package content? Don't be save files go something to those mm -hmm. But they're not they are all uh, uh, well, so all don't, 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 don't get me started don't. yelling about package content too, but that's a whole other <laughs> so you could potentially have to configure talk to an upstream like the because you go looking for a library, it doesn't find the library, it can actually feed back and say you need to install the list. So, so yeah, so we're we're, we're kind of running out of time. I, I wanna I wanna sort of thank all of you for being here. I think we've done what we hope to do, which is we've got folks thinking about some of these issues, some as evidenced by the fact that a bunch of you are jumping in and starting to think about you know how might we solve this problem. So I feel really good about the effort that I convinced Tom to make to actually put this because I just showed up, but. <clears throat> so thanks, Tom. It's Tom's first time at LCA. He's got another talk later tomorrow. On. Tomorrow, actually, yeah. So and that's on closure. On closure, yes. A very interesting topic in and of itself. And before we let everybody go, I want to send out a special thanks to Stefano Zaccaroli, who is the current uh, Debian project leader, because he gave me a lot of good ideas and pointers on uh, CUDF uh, and this whole dependency problem. And what I'll do is I'll I'll publish these slides that you didn't see and these other links um, probably the easiest way to communicate that to you is uh, follow my uh, address on Twitter or identica at T marble and I'll, I'll microblog pointers there okay great any last things before we wrap up excellent cool thank you so much for your time and attention <laughs>